So football is still very much in the dark ages. I mean, is it? Is it? It's a very. I mean, it's a very masculine world. Yeah. I mean, women have found it very difficult to, to, to break in, whether it be on the physio side, yeah. whether it be the media side, um, whether it be playing football. It's taken them a long time to, to, to gain yeah. some respect in the game. How? Where are we? Well, if you think back, you know, um, if you think back 25, 30 years ago, or even longer than that, when football first came back in this country, it was a white working class man's game. At the end of a hard week's work, they'd go to the game and they'd let all their tensions out and they'd have a drink and bad words and everything. That's, that's what it was. And the women stayed at home. Okay. Now, as we evolve and we learn and we educate ourselves and, and, and we start to move on, if you look at the best example I can give is when you first started playing, Jason, think about the stadiums, think about the training pitches, think about how you used to get fit pre-season, think about how teams used to travel. And think about it now. It has completely evolved. The only thing that hasn't evolved is this mindset. Now, it's not a matter of, you know, we should be doing it. We need to do it. It's got to evolve because we live in a, a, a world now where one false word can be on social media like that. And someone's reputation can be gone just like that. Now, one thing I've spoken about a lot in the last, you know, year or two is we are moving into an era where someone will lose their job based on what comes out of their mouth. And if the reports are, uh, are true or accurate, I think that's what's happened to Malcolm McKay, because the reports say that he was going to be Crystal Palace's manager. Now, not because of his, his ability as a manager or a coach, it's because of what has come out of his mouth that's cost him uh, a, a job. Now, I don't, the end game for me is that that doesn't happen, because people recognise, not about the job losing, but the effect of what they say of what comes out of their mouth. They've got to be held responsible for what comes out of their mouth. Now, if something like that comes out of their mouth, they have to ha uh, uh, hold their hand up, accept responsibility and the consequences of that. They must educate themselves and make sure it never happens again. Because like I said, there are victims on the receiving end of all of this that feel it too. And they need protecting and they need help just as much as the perpetrators. So how is this situation remedied? How is this situation dealt with? What should the punishment be? Should it be a fine? Should it be a ban? Should it be a lengthy ban? You see, I, I, the thing about banning play, uh, people is, unless there's some form of education um, attached to it, it just creates resentment. It has to be explained. Um, and, and however long that is, I mean, there's an investigation going along with the FA at the moment, which is why we can't talk as much about it as, we, as, 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 as you'd like to. Um, and they will do what they do. I think the most important thing that comes out of this, the most important thing all this affair shows me is that people need education. People need to understand why these words are unacceptable. And what should happen to Malcolm McKay? I've heard people say he should be banned for a year and, and all of that. I don't know, I'm not just sure whether that should happen because you see, he should, quite rightly, be, get a new job. He should be rehabilitated and, and, and put back into that environment. Of course he should, because we will not we will never find out whether he's learned. That's the only way you're gonna do it. You don't ban people and then ostracize them, because that doesn't make sense. You you educate them. You know, he's himself admitted that he needs to go on, on uh, equality and diversity education courses, which is which is what should should be mandatory for all managers. Um, but the punishment I think for him is going to be facing up to players who you know are still offended by it because people will be that's going to be the punishment for him you know um you know i've seen managers lose their job and been out of the game for a year and then come back and, and come back into a job so that's not the issue the issue is what's going to happen will he have learned and improved and the only way that's going to happen is if people educate him and listen to what he's got to say first because it's better out than in when people say things of a discriminatory nature i'd rather them say it I'd rather it out than in, because then you've got something to work with. If people drive it underground, then we end up with these covert texts and messages and which cause a problem in the first place. So I know you said at the beginning you were shocked and you're saddened and mm. disappointed. Do you and Kick It Out see this as an opportunity in which to, to, to run with and say, here we go, and there's another example, we can use this? I, I think, you know, it, it's, it's all, the, the whole situation is sad. And the unfortunate thing is, or fortunate, whichever way you want to look at it, is it does give us a chance to educate people, to highlight the issues. I believe that you know we already do equality and diversity training for scholars. There's no reason why we shouldn't be doing it for the managers. 
but it, it does highlight the fact that education is needed. Um, we're football's um, um, inclusion and diversity campaign, so if we are, then I think we're in a good place to be able to assist and advise whoever's going to do the training. We, we're in a position where we can assist and advise, and I think that's what we should do. When you go back to the 70s, maybe the 60s, maybe the 70s, mm -hmm. certainly the 80s, um, footballers were a minority. Uh, black footballers yeah. in, in the freshman day. Yeah. Now we see five, six, sometimes seven or eight players mm -hmm. in that same team. Mm -hmm. Now we've seen that change. Why hasn't that changed? Why hasn't that change progressed into coaching and management? Um, I think again, it's a little bit. If you take if you take black footballers in the seventies, it wasn't something that people were comfortable seeing because they'd just never seen it before. Now roll that on twenty five years, black men in charge of football clubs is not something that's that people are, are comfortable seeing it isn't something that people have seen before um, it's a problem because I think it's deeper than than just black managers because within senior football there are four jobs you can go for manager assistant first team coach reserve team manager there's 92 clubs that's what 386 jobs okay so it's not just 92 it's 300 now I used to sit there and think I'll be conservative, there's about 50 that are black, it's, it's less than that. At the 386, there is a problem. There's a, it's endemic in the game, there's no dispute in that. Now, what happens is, you know, there's you know, 20, 25%, maybe more, of coaches that go on the courses are from black and ethnic minority backgrounds. Now, the problem that you have is between getting your B license or your A license and going into the professional game, there is a problem there. That's where the issue is, and, and it is an issue. And, you know, there are, I believe what should happen is there are a lot of young black coaches who are within football clubs, some of the Damian Matthews at, at Charlton, who should be highlighted. Because what it shows the young black coaches is there is a pathway. Because at the moment they don't see a pathway, you know, that's reflective of them. And what needs to be highlighted is, yes, there is a pathway. Yes, there is, you know, to a certain degree. At the top level, we have a problem because there are no black managers. 20, it's nearly 30% of players are black or ethnic minority within, within football. There are no black managers. There are none reflective of, the play, of some of the players that play. That's a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, you know, why are black players not, or black coaches not getting jobs? You know, it, why, why is that? Because the really rule that, that's come across from, from, from the States, mm. um, we've got Tigana, of course, going back. Ruth yep. Bullitt is another one, Chris Tewton, Chris Powell, Rosinia. Paul mm -hmm. Ince, you mentioned Damien, a good friend yeah. of mine, Eddie yeah. Newman, a good yeah. friend of mine uh, yeah. uh, as well. But for them to for them to be offered jobs, they've got to be offered jobs by owners, by chairmen, yeah, by, right. by board members. Yeah. And there aren't any black chairmen, there aren't any black board yeah. members that I can think of. So, yeah. so oh, how long is this process? Well, I, I, again, I mean... And has um, it got to take someone who's black of, of a position to, to see the light to, to I'd like to think not what I'd like to think is that people are being judged on their ability now the clear fact of the matter is that that's not the case that's not happening because you cannot tell me there are no managers or coaches that are black that are good enough that that's that's just blatantly not happened not, not, not the case now there is an issue and and you know as a coach myself I who, who struggled and suffered to, to get to a level. The last thing I wanted to say was, it was because I was a black guy. But you end up sitting there saying, well, I'm not quite sure what else it can be when you're overlooked again and overlooked again and overlooked again. And, and I was overlooked in jobs for people with less experience, no experience, less qualifications. And, you know, I, find, I found that amazing. It, it really shocked me because you start to look at yourself, you start to doubt yourself when people with lesser ability are going above you, that's a problem. You don't want to sit here and say it's because I'm a black guy. Of course you don't want to do that. That's your last resort. But it's coming to the point where people are going to have to realise that, you know, it can only be that. You know, I don't want to sit here and say it, but there comes a point where, you know, it's happening too often. And it's not just, you know, if you take Chris Town and, and Chris Hewton, for example, it's not that they lost their jobs, because that, that can happen sometimes. It's how long it takes for them to get another job. Because I don't know many black managers who have got a job, lost it, got a job, lost it, got a job, lost it. It doesn't seem to happen. Now, they're the questions that we need to challenge the people that are in charge, the decision makers, the, the hirers and the firers. They're the people who need to 
to, to come forward and explain. I think what there needs to be is in the you know in the in the appointment procedure there needs to be some some form of transparency. So why didn't someone get a job? You know, I, I think what should happen is from when you apply for a job, if you don't get it, you should get some feedback. You know, well, you didn't get it because the pool of managers is strong and you're probably not quite as experienced. You go for an interview, you don't get it, there should be a reason why, well, you know, you didn't sell yourself enough, you qualified, or whatever, you know, but there should be some transparency. So when you're left, you have, you have an idea of what you've got to aim for. At the moment, I mean, I, I used to apply for jobs and I can remember applying for a job and there was a friend of mine who applied for it too, less experienced than me. And uh, about three weeks later, he said to me, well, you know, I've got a reply. And, you know, they said to me, you know, you know I wasn't quite experienced. What was your reply? You know, what did you get? What did they say? I've got a reply. But there was a uh, danger well, also as well that that might not be the cover you're asking. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. This, is, this is the... This that's the dilemma. That's the, see, that's the dilemma. See, because, again, and is this, this puts the, this I is worry where, about that. And that's why I don't want to sit here and go, it's the cover of my skin. But... You know, when you sit there sometimes and say, well, you know what, him, who's a white guy, less qualified, got a reply. I didn't get a reply. Now, as time goes by, you keep applying, you don't get a reply. You keep applying, you don't get a reply. People you know have less ability sometimes, sometimes better ability. Apply and, the only, and apply and get replies. And the only difference is that I'm a black guy and he's a white guy. It's playing about in your head. It, it is. And, and you start to think of, and things start to happen where you think, well, hold on. I'm still not progressing as I should have done. You know, me as a coach, when I qualified nearly 10 years ago, I'm thinking, you know, you, you have ambitions. By this age, I'm looking at being here. And it was so obvious to me that it wasn't going to happen when people with lesser ability and lesser experience kept on moving above me. But is that going to be made harder now? Because we see so often coaches come from abroad and they seem to be overlooked by British coaches. And it, it seems as if that it's not just maybe black, it's now... British coaches, the top jobs in this country, tend, I know with Brendan Rodgers at Liverpool, mm. maybe that's not the case, mm. but you look at some of the, even down to the championship now, you, you get managers being offered roles that, that are overlooked because they're British. Well, I've been talking about this for the last two or three months, where I've been saying, you know, it needs to be taken, and I've been using black coaches as an example, I've been saying, listen, you're sleepwalking into a spell where it's going to happen to British coaches, white British coaches. And you're going to be saying, and, and, and you're going to have black coaches going, welcome to our world. Because this is what has been happening to us all the time. And you haven't recognised it till it started to happen to you. Now, for me, there is that danger because there are a lot of foreign coaches, uh, owners coming in. There are a lot of foreign coaches coming in. Now, I, you know, 20 years ago when I was playing, I was thinking, well, you know what? When I quit, I reckon I could become a League One manager or, you know, Division Four as it was then. Manager, that's where I'll cut my teeth before I move up. Not the case now. Not the case now at all. If you look down the levels, real experienced coaches are having to drop down the levels because foreign coaches are coming in at the top. And that is what's happening. And weird enough, that's the same thing that's happening with players. Foreign players are coming in at the top. They're good foreign players, but our better players are having to drop down the divisions. It's the same thing that's happening with managers, and it's something that we have to address because you know millions of pounds is spent on educating our coaches and going through the coaching qualifications and what have you. And with with the with the uh, the I suppose the end game becoming league managers and coaches and working in a professional game and it's not happening and it needs to be addressed.